Hey everyone, it is Monday, and yes, you know what that means. In this expert series, it means we bring back Greg Dickerson. How you doing, sir? Doing good, Michael. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, folks. So if you folks, if you don't know this, Greg has his own playlist on this channel. It's got hours and hours of great information. You need to take a look at the playlist and just find find what topics interest you. And I, I guarantee you the next three are going to be very, very interesting. And Greg, we're going to start with how do you find deals, both now and you know, over the last decade or so, what have been some ways you have found the deals that you have done? Okay. So, and we'll break down different types. So there's commercial, sure. multifamily, land, and then residential single family. So, you know, that's uh, what's behind you on the wall there, one rental at a time. So let's talk about houses. So there's different strategies. There's an MLS strategy and my most successful MLS strategy listed properties in any market has been to shoot for vacant properties that have been on the market longer than the average days by at least double. Mm -hmm. So if days on market in your areas is, you know, right now you can't really count it, but under yeah. normal circumstances, 30 is a hot market. Yep. Um, you want to look for stuff that's been on for, you know, three or four months that's vacant and preferably has had a price reduction or two. So those are my MLS strategy. I always pretty much filtered those and went after those. And that's where I got my best deals. And they were usually um, probate properties, ah, you know, estate yeah. properties. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's, you know, from a vacancy standpoint. So if you're looking at MLS, that's a way to do it. The other one is for MLS, you want to look at, you know, even occupied properties that have been on the market for a long time and have had multiple price reductions, yep. then just make an offer where it works for you. So, you know, you never get a deal you didn't make an offer on. So you yeah. got to be making a lot of offers. That's the key. Make a lot of offers. So that's MLS, you know, for single family residential, um, you know, you got to find motivated sellers. Properties aren't motivated. Sellers are. So you look for distressed sellers. Everybody calls them distressed properties. Properties don't get distressed. The sellers do. Now, obviously, uh, you know, properties can get run down and you can call that distress, but you need motivation at the seller level. So you need tax delinquent, you need behind on utilities, you need evictions. If, if it's a landlord, um, you need, uh, you know, uh, condemnation orders, you know, where the property has been condemned. Um, you know, those types of things are motivations. Then you can get in your 30, 60, 90 day late category in, in those things. And you can stack all that stuff and create lists where you've got multiple motivations and you want to have on every list, if you're a buyer and you're not a realtor and you're looking for just strictly, you know, wholesale type deals where you're buying under market value directly from the seller, stack a couple of those motivations on there. Now, mm -hmm. if you also have a real estate license and a relationship with a realtor, you can broaden that a little bit because any potential seller that responds can be a monetized deal from a listing standpoint. If you're also an agent and an investor, you can list it or refer that listing to another agent and get a marketing fee or commission. Mm -hmm. um, so that, those are what you want to look for in motivation. And then you have your marketing. Got to have a motivated seller website. In this day and age, you got to have somewhere for your marketing to go. If you're marketing directly to homeowners, whether it's YouTube, text, email, doesn't matter what it is, mail, um, Facebook ads, whatever, you got to send them somewhere. And they're going to be looking for you and they're going to be looking at you. So all your social media for you and your company needs to be consistent for what you do. So when a seller goes and looks you up, they see a consistent theme, consistent message, and they see that you're a professional. That's going to make you stand out from, from you know, the average individual that jumps into wholesaling for a couple of weeks, sends a bunch of mail, and then doesn't answer the phone. And, you know, it's just total, has no idea what to do when they get a deal, you know, or somebody responds. So um, that's that credibility, you know, uh, image on the internet credibility package. So when you, you know, respond with a seller, you can send them your information, those types of things. Um, you know, so you want to have that motivated seller website, you drive traffic to that through your mail, your email, your text, your uh, Facebook, YouTube ads, whatever you're doing, all of it drives traffic to that motivated seller website. Some markets, newspaper still works good. Some markets, radio and TV still work really well. Um, and then other markets, you know, people are door knocking and doing well. So there's a lot of different avenues that you can take there. But the key is you got to drive them back to that website so you can capture their information. And then when, you're, when they respond, answer the phone immediately. <laughs> it's speed to lead. You'd be amazed how many people spend thousands and thousands of dollars and don't respond, don't answer the lead. They don't follow up and follow through. So what's follow up and follow through? So the lead comes in, you talk to them. Yes, they want to sell. No, they don't. Okay. Two key things. Um, is it okay for me to follow up with you in a week, in a month, whatever? And then two, before you hang up, do you have any other property you'd like to sell? Or do you know anybody else who has any property they'd like to sell? What else, where else? And you'd be surprised what people will say 
that didn't come up in an hour long conversation. Oh yeah, I got six lots over here. I have three houses in Las Vegas or, you know, whatever. You never know what's going to come up when you say, do you have any other property you'd like to sell? Or do you know anybody who has any property you'd like to sell? I always end those conversations with anybody and everybody, no matter what kind of property I'm buying. So yeah. that's single family homes. Yeah. The one thing I'll add to single family homes is a, I built my entire financial freedom on single family homes and MLS, right? That's, that's, mm -hmm. You know, again, I started back in 02, right? Wholesaling wasn't a thing, or at least I wasn't aware of it. Direct marketing wasn't there. Uh, one of the things that I did besides everything you've covered is, is I looked for holes in the market. So what do I mean by that? Uh, the most obvious one is a, a two bedroom, one bath. That's like 1200 square feet, right? If I could find a way to buy that because those would be priced lower than a three bedroom and then add the wall and the closet and make and rent it as a three, uh, you know, I did that you know, a, a dozen times. Cause you know, if you, I could, uh, back in the day, right. I could buy a two bedroom for like 80 grand that would rent for like seven fifty. but if it became a three bedroom, I'd get 1100. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I had three grand, maybe 3,500 for a wall, a door and a closet, it, it's a home run. Right. Uh, right. Another one is I looked for properties that were not good for owner occupants. And what do I, what does that mean? Well, back in the day, um, Houses were built anywhere, right? Now there are industrial areas and you know commercial areas. And I would look for houses in semi-industrial areas, right? There's I remember one street, it had like a car, like a car lot here, and then four houses, and then like something else on the other end. And I bought three of those four houses. Um, because again, no, not many owners would want to be there, but they're fine rentals, right? So I got a discount being you know, a discount on price and, and rentals. So again, I look I look for holes, but yeah. Price cuts, days on market. The other thing is, I tried, I tried first day listings. Um, you know, if it really made sense, but th those are you know few and far between. But yeah, everything you said was spot on. I think. Yeah, and then there's a few other. You know, you have your HUD, you know, home store where the yeah. HUD foreclosures are listed. You have, you know, uh, some of the banks list their own foreclosures. Bank of America, you know, yeah. top Wells Fargo, they have REO listings, and then you have just foreclosure websites in general, auction.com, those types of things. But have right got, now, very competitive. You, yeah, have you gotten every, anything off an auction site before? Not off the site, but I have bought listed properties that were bank yeah. owned. Yeah, um, me, yeah, that, me too. that were on the MLS. And one of them, believe it or not, the day it hit the market, it was a bank owned property, the day it hit the market. And I was the first one in, it was on a weekend. And, yeah. you know, the agent knew me and knew that I could close and was going to close, you know, the following week. Yep. Um, and and uh, so I went and looked at it, you know, put it under contract and got it, you know, so yeah. Yeah, that's the first that's day. First day listings. Yeah. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if, if I'm going to do a first day listing, I always go with the listing broker. Right? Yeah. I, as soon as I see it, I usually call them if I can find their number and go, hey, Hopefully they know me by now, but if they don't, you know, tell them who I am and go, Hey, this is the number. Yeah. Is it going to work or not? Now, most everything I described was looking at it from a value add standpoint in terms of, I want to buy it and, and have instant equity. So yep. like to your point, if you're looking at it for a long-term holder or rental, or even a BRRRR strategy where, you know, maybe your only equity build could be paying down the principal to refinance mm -hmm. later and redeploy. And I've said this before, and I noticed one of your viewers commented, you can pay anything you want for a property. And somebody's like, Wow, you can pay anything you want. Absolutely. <laughs> what are your return requirements? Do you want to earn 3%, 5%, 10%, 20%? Whatever it is that you're looking to earn on that down payment that you put down on that property and whatever your you know out-of-pocket yep. expenses are, you know, it's up to you. So totally you can pay anything. So you know, you look at listed properties, and like you said, if you know your market and know your rents, doesn't matter what the price of the property is. You don't have to buy discounted directly from sellers. You can buy any listed property that you think you can rent that matches your yeah. return requirements. Yeah. And let's so just put some, put some real numbers on it. Right. And I bought several at list price. Actually, I've paid mm -hmm. more than list price a couple of times, but right. I want to, you know, let's just pick a number. I want a 6% return. Right. And if, if I can pay list price or slightly above and earn my 6% return, that's a good deal. Right, because yeah, a good six percent return is on your down payment, what you yeah. pull out of your pocket, exactly. Because you're going to finance cash. the rest. Exactly, real, real cash. And again, in in my market, when I did that deal, six was a good deal. Other yeah. markets, six percent is terrible. But learn your market, right? Mm -hmm. Do your deals. If if you're in my market and you don't want six, you want four percent. Well, guess what? You can pay more. That's just how the math yeah. works. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and also to your point, looking at properties that, you know, it may not be resale type properties, but they could be good rentals. They're in yep. bad locations or on the railroad tracks, you know, whatever. You wouldn't want to live there. You wouldn't want to buy it yeah. and try to flip it, but it may be a great rental. So um, a lot of times, time. you know, 
those can make sense too. And then, you know, to your point, you know, I always look at the multiple exits. So yeah. I'm not a buy and hold guy. I'm a, I'm a recycle the cash guy. So whenever I look at a property, I'm always looking at it. Can I sell it? Mm. And if I can't sell it, I don't want to mess with it. But, you know, there's other things you can look for. Does it have residual land that you can carve out and build another structure on? Um, does it have, can it be redeveloped and put mm. multiple structures? I've done those deals in the past where I bought one house that had two lots and they needed to move out. They needed money so they could they could put a down payment on a new house they wanted somewhere else, but they needed to stay in the house until that was finished. Mm. So I worked a deal out with them where, you know, I gave them 50 grand up front. And I think the whole thing was 200,000. Um, I was able to start construction on the two lots. The whole property conveyed to me. They stayed in that house for three months, rent free while their new house was being built. Mm -hmm. And then um, once they turned the house over to me, and vacated, they got the rest of their money. Mm. Then I went and renovated that house that they were in, sold it, that zeroed out my basis. So I was in the land, you know, at zero basis, sold those houses. And I don't know, I made, you know, $300,000 on that deal in six months. Nice. And I think I only had maybe 150 to 200 out of pocket at any given time during the whole process. Right, because you were pulling it. I, I gotcha. That's yeah. very, very cool. So, yeah, yeah, so there's always deals. And then like you're talking about, maybe you can pop the lid mm -hmm. and go up. Maybe you yeah. can go out, maybe you can do, you know, maybe internally you can reconfigure the space to get more bedrooms. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more to MLS listed properties yes. that meet the eye a lot of times. So you got to look carefully. And again, it goes back to knowing your market, knowing what you can get from a resale, from a rent value, knowing what you can do to it and then making offers. You got to be making offers. You'll never buy a property. You don't make an offer on. I love that. I love that. So let's, uh, let's switch it up to, uh, I don't know, do you want to go multifamily or other commercial yeah. next? Multifamily? Yeah, commercial and multifamily is going to be the same. So generally with larger properties, commercial and multifamily, you have two things that are different than single family. Number one, you usually have somebody who's a little bit more sophisticated. They're usually an investor and they're more willing to be creative with you and finance you if you know what you're doing mm -hmm. and or you can build a relationship with them uh, in a way that they're going to want to take you under their wing if you don't have the resources. If you have the resources and you, you, know, you can close, that's best. But number one, you got to know, you got to educate yourself. You got to mm -hmm. know the market, know the business, know the space. Uh, they are investors and they're going to know how much you know by the questions you ask and yeah. by the way you approach them. They're going to know by how you handle yourself in that conversation, whether you know what you're doing or not. So if you don't, just tell them, look, I'm new. I'm a new investor. I want to get into this business. Don't know what I'm doing. You interested in selling? Tell me about your property. So just mm -hmm. be honest. Yep. Um, but the ways to do that, a lot of people are big on texting these days, you know, yeah. with the text blast for finding sellers. When it comes to commercial properties, again, you're generally dealing with more sophisticated, experienced investors. So, um, you know, you can send them a letter, but it needs to be professional letterhead. And again, all of your website, social media, all that needs to be consistent, congruent, and it needs to look professional so that you look credible when they go look you up because they're going to look you up. If you're sending an email, you need to make sure that it, you know, email is a company extension, not Gmail, not Yahoo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that it has a, you know, Mike at one rental at a time dot com, you know, so that you've got a company email address. Um, and then, you know, send them a professional letter. You can start with that, follow that up with a phone call and then follow it up with an email. So that's how you can include all three. But there is no substitute commercial multifamily, those types of properties for a phone call. It's one to one. It's mm -hmm. person to person. You know, investors like to talk that, you yeah. know, I, I'm not going to respond to just the letter or something. I want to yeah. talk to the individual. No. Yeah, me too. The one thing I'll say, having bought multifamily and commercial properties is uh, different than single families is a, I would say probably 80 to maybe 85% of the available inventory is controlled by a set of agents, right? Residential it's, you know, Hey, everybody, everybody gets a couple of listings a year, right? It's not really yeah. dominated, but most markets have, I don't know, like Fresno probably has 10 agents that control certainly 70% of the multifamily. So the good news is there's only 10 people to get to know. The bad news is, is lots of people want to get to know them and they probably already have their list of, of favorites. But, you know, that's something I've seen. The other thing is, is every- so They do, but let me touch on that. So <laughs> I was talking about direct to seller and, you know, how do you approach oh, the bad. sellers? Mm -hmm. So yeah, in every market, there's there's brokers that control the markets. And when you say control, they just, they're out there. They know the yeah. sellers. They've been doing it for years. So they have access to inventory um, and they specialize. So there's going to be the ones that are top in the multifamily, mm -hmm. land, for sure. retail, office, industrial. They're going to specialize in those types of properties. Um, so you want to get to know them. And again, um, they do have a lot of people after them, especially for the more competitive assets. Um, 
mobile home parks, you know, same thing, self storage, same thing. You have people that specialize in these different things. So the way you get to know them is you take them out, you mm -hmm. take them out to eat, you take them out to lunch and you don't try to BS them because they're going to know by the way you handle yourself, the questions you ask and how you conduct yourself, whether or not you know what you're doing. And the number one thing they want to know is, can you close? Yes. Number two is, can you close again? <laughs> and number three, are you going to be easy to work with? So, yeah. you know, you've got to show that you can perform. They're not, brokers are not going to work with you and get creative with you unless they have something they can't sell or can't move. And they've yeah. already talked to their seller about creative and that's going to be listed in there. So you can go to LoopNet right now and you can keyword search LoopNet for owner financing and you'll find all the owner finance deals on LoopNet. You know, people say LoopNet's where deals go to die. It's not, there are deals on LoopNet a lot of them are left on there and they're marketing for commercial brokers, but there are some deals on LoopNet as well. And you can search by creative financing to or owner financing and find deals that are owners are willing to finance. Usually brokers are not going to want to entertain that, but if they have something they can't sell, they might entertain it. But the main thing they want to know is that you can perform, you know what you're doing. You're not going to be hard to work with. You're not going to try to beat them down, beat them up and try to, you know, work them out of their commission. You know, yeah. you want to be easy to deal with, close quick, close fast and do what you say you're going to do. And you'll get deals from brokers coming to you all the time. Yeah. The last thing I'll say about multifamily specifically is, I don't know, probably four or five times a year, a property will get listed by clearly a residential agent, right? All they've always done residential, mm -hmm. but somebody they knew or some kind of referral or something. And they list it, they list a, like a, like a 20 unit building as a single family residential. Right. And then yeah. the numbers look all wacky. Right. And most people ignore him, but I'm like, I've seen this enough time. I was like, ah, we got a rookie agent. <laughs> I'm going to call this person and see if we can't work something out. Cause it just looks weird. Like, you know, my market's 200 and suddenly there's a $2.2 .2 million listing. And how can that have, you know, 18,000 square feet and, you know, 26 bedrooms. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's just, they're just listed wacky. It happens every year. I mean, like four or five times a year. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, but you know, commercial multifamily is different, but the you know, key is, you, you, you know, you got to know what you're doing. You got to know the market and, you know, you can build those relationships with the, with the agents and the brokers in the market. If they know you're serious and, you know, if you don't have the resources, don't waste your time because yeah, they're, they're just not going to, they're not going to deal with you. Anything, uh, anything, if you go kind of office or residential, I mean, um, like strip malls, things I've never bought and any other things that make those unique or different to, to go look at? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're different in terms of the metrics, how they operate. Um, you know, those are easier to, to evaluate because if they're triple net, really mm -hmm. it's debt service. That's your only expense because everything else is passed through to the tenant. You just need to understand what those pass-throughs are. So the income and expenses are much easier to evaluate. Your returns are easier to calculate. Um, you know, the biggest key to those is, you know, the financing is very different on office, retail, industrial than it is for like multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, you know, uh, right now, very difficult time. So uh, you really got to know what you're doing to get into that space right now. Yeah, very, very cool. So as we wrap up this first uh, section on finding deals or finding motivated sellers, any kind of clothing, closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, like I said, know your market, know your space, know what you're doing, pick, pick a type and go after it, focus on it, become an expert at it before you, you know, try to branch out and do other yeah. things. We didn't touch on land, but that. you know, that was as a developer builder, you know, that's something I've done over the years as farm vacant land. Mm. And again, all works the same way, you know, marketing conversations, you know, knowing what you're after, knowing what you're, can, what you're doing and what you can do with the land. But um but that's the biggest thing. Educate yourself, know what you're doing, be informed and ask good questions and be honest. Yeah. The last thing I'll say on finding motivated sellers is, is don't, don't try it for a week, a month or, you know, 10 weeks and suddenly think it doesn't work. Motivation is out there. You got to find, you got to be consistent. Especially right now. It was easy yeah. in 2008, nine. They were yeah. falling all over you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You didn't have to go far. It was a capital oh. letters in MLS must sell any price yeah. taken. Yeah, exactly. Very, very cool. Well, thanks, man. This is fun. The next topic is going to be due diligence. This should be a lot of fun and we'll get to that in a minute. Thanks buddy. Yep.